Hi, welcome to Danny After Dark. If you're new here, make sure to like and subscribe so you don't miss a notification or a new episode. Tonight is episode three, the final episode in my series on Lyle and Eric Menendez, also known as the Menendez Brothers. If you missed episode one and two, make sure to go back so you're caught up so you know exactly where to dive on in. So let's do this. Let's finish the series on Lyle and Eric Menendez. We left off March 8th, 1990. Lyle was driving around in Eric's Jeep when a police pulled him over and arrested him. Eric was in Israel playing tennis, received word from his family what was happening. So on March 11th, 1990, detectives met Eric at the Los Angeles International Airport and they arrested him. The Menendez family retained very good and very expensive legal counsel for both Lyle and Eric. Selected to represent Eric was attorney Leslie Abramson. Selected to represent Lyle was attorney Jill Lansing. The brothers were arraigned for the murders of their parents on March 26, 1990. When the brothers entered the courtroom, they acted, hmm, well, exactly like you think they would. They walked in smug, arrogant, and waved and smiled at their friends and relatives, not understanding the seriousness of what was happening. The judge read the charges to the brothers, quote, you have been charged with multiple murder for financial gain while laying in wait with a loaded firearm for which if convicted, you could receive the death penalty. How do you plead, end quote. Eric, answered first, almost with a smirk on his face, quote, not guilty, your honor, end quote. Next to speak was Lyle, and all he muttered was, quote, not guilty, end quote. They were both charged with first degree murder. In court, the audio tapes were revealed where the brothers admitted they had killed their parents. This was a shock to the Menendez family they had not heard the tapes before, so they did not know this. Some family members who have been very vocal in their support of Lyle and Eric soon dropped out of sight completely. On December 8th, 1992, the Menendez brothers were indicted by the Los Angeles County Grand Jury on charges that they murdered their parents. They were eligible for the death penalty. On March 14, 1993, Judge Weisenberg ruled that in the case of Lyle and Eric Menendez, they would be tried together. However, each brother would have their own separate jury. So how is this gonna work? Well, during a pretrial hearing on June 9, 1993, the defense for both brothers would admit that the brothers had murdered their parents. They put it out there right away. The defense would try to prove to the jurors that it was Jose and Kitty, not Lyle and Eric, who should be held accountable for why the murders were committed. They argued that the brothers had been instilled with feelings of fear for a long period of time. Well, there was a big problem with this defense. The brothers had never complained to their psychologist, other family, or even their friends about any type of abuse. So for the prosecution to win, what they would have to do is prove to the jurors that the brothers were liars and that their stories of abuse were just simply not true. The official trial began on July 20th, 1993. The prosecution was the one to open. They described the brutality of the murders, the six wounds to Jose and the 10 wounds to Kitty. They allowed, laid the foundation for their theory that the brothers had killed their parents, quote, while lying in wait, end quote, while their parents were dozing on the couch. They would often remind the jurors 
throughout the whole trial, that if Lyle and Eric could lie so frequently, so easily, and with such detail to avoid being caught, then they could also lie about child abuse to try to avoid them getting the death sentence. They would also remind the jury repeatedly about the brother's spending sprees after the murders using their parents' money. Lyle's defense then spoke next. They stated, quote, what we will prove to you is that the murders were committed out of fear. Fear of two parents who were so brutal, so manipulative, so sexually perverse, that they drove their own sons to the most desperate act of defilement, end quote. Eric's defense stated that Eric was, quote, the real victim of the family, end quote. They claimed that Jose had been molesting him for years. The reason Eric didn't tell anybody or tell the truth earlier, because he did not trust anybody with the secret. They described how Eric was, quote, groomed for his father's sexual gratification, end quote. And in regards to his mother, Kitty, quote, her children were afraid of her. That's why she is dead, end quote. Seriously, that's your argument? Oh boy. The prosecution stated that the brothers had wanted to, quote, execute their parents and not get caught, end quote. The prosecution had Dr. Ozio, remember, he was the therapist that Lyle and Eric admitted the murders to. They testified before both Lyle and Eric's juries. He stated the brothers wanted to kill Jose because he was dominating their lives and they made them feel inferior. Kitty was being murdered because the brothers didn't want to leave her behind as a witness. And Kitty could not have emotionally survived without Jose. So they were in a sense doing their mom a favor by murdering her. Okay. They thought their parents had disinherited them from their will. And that was another reason that Lyle and Eric wanted to get rid of them. The prosecution also had several witnesses that showed that the brothers were accomplished liars who planned and carried out the murders of their parents. In fact, Lyle and Eric's own friends, their best friends, even turned on them to testify for the prosecution. When Lyle testified in his own defense, he testified that Kitty sexually abused him when he was about 11 to 12 years old. It was his testimony that was trying to build up to the description of the events that led up to the night of the murders. And he described shooting his father and also described shooting his mother for the jury. Lyle admitted on stand to offering his girlfriend, Jamie Pisarek, money if she would testify that Jose had made unwanted sexual advances toward her. Well, Jamie refused this bribe and went to the police and told them. This all came out at trial. The prosecution brought up the fact that Lyle had never told Dr. Ozio about any type of sexual abuse. They were successful in identifying inconsistencies in Lyle's version of events. Next, when Eric began to testify in his own defense, he stated he believed his parents were gonna kill him. He also said that Kitty seemed to have magical powers. She knew where he went. She knew where his friends are, who they were, and everything that he did. That just sounds like being a parent. Under cross-examination, Eric seemed to have difficulty remembering details. In fact, the prosecution was able to catch Eric in several lies. One of them, Eric admitted that he did not think his parents would have disinherited him from their will. Well, now began jury deliberation. On January 13th, 1994, after 16 days of deliberation, Eric's jury announced they were deadlocked. 
on January 25th, 1994, after 24 days of deliberation, Lyle's jury announced they were deadlocked. So Judge Weisenberg had to declare a mistrial in both cases. So February 28th, 1995, Judge Weisenberg set a new trial date of June 12th, 1995 for the retrial of the Menendez brothers. In April, 1995, the same judge, Judge Weisenberg, ruled that the brothers would be retried together in front of a single jury this time. This retrial began in August of 1995. Prosecution now had a team of brand new lawyers for their side. The defense team was a little different. Leslie Abramson continued to represent Eric but now she was being paid by the taxpayers of Los Angeles County because the Menendez estate had completely ran out of money at this point. Lyle, he now qualified for representation by the public defender's office. So he had received a new lawyer. Now, the prosecution presented a whole new theory at trial about the way in which the killings were carried out. They played a tape of the brothers' confessions to the murders, arguing that the brothers were motivated by greed and they tried to get their hands on their parents' money as fast as they could. What the prosecution also did this time that was different was they showed jurors the autopsy and the crime scene photographs. Remember, when we spoke of the autopsy, how brutal the murders were. The prosecution also had somebody named Dr. Roger McCarthy reconstruct the shootings. McCarthy was able to determine the sequence of shots and showed that the murders were premeditated and deliberate. Specifically, McCarthy was able to show that Jose and Kitty were sitting side by side on the sofa when they were attacked, the brothers aimed at their kneecap shots to make their parents look like the killings were done like a mafia hit. Remember, the brothers had said that the night of the murder. The defense again stated that the brothers killed out of, quote, mind-numbing adrenaline pumping fear, end quote, and that their parents would kill them for threatening to expose family secrets, as well as the brothers believed that their parents had supernatural powers. Oh, here we go again. And quote, knew everything, end quote, about their son's activities. The reconstruction of Dr. McCarthy's evidence was disputed by the defense who brought in several experts to try to debunk his reconstruction. Eric began to testify for 15 days of testimony in his own defense. What Eric testified was that his parents were violent. Kitty had humiliated and degraded him and Jose beat and molested him. And Jose had told him that he'd been written out of the will for not living up to his father's expectations. The defense stated that Eric suffered from learned helplessness, which is a sign of post-traumatic stress disorder, otherwise known as PTSD. However, the prosecution jumped all over this. They pointed out to the jury that Eric had lied for six months to the police, lied to his family, lied to his friends about the murders, before him and his brother Lyle were arrested. The prosecution also argued that Eric did not suffer from, quote, learned helplessness, end quote, from PTSD. Remember, Eric bought two shotguns, loaded his weapons, went to the shooting reach to learn how to fire the weapon. This behavior showed rebelliousness and assertiveness, which is inconsistent with the passiveness of learned helplessness. Next was Lyle's defense. And this is where it gets good. 
His attorneys did not want him to testify in his own defense, so he did not. This was because if Lyle were to testify, there was damning impeachment evidence the prosecution had gathered against him since the first trial. Well, what was that? The prosecutors had taped recorded conversations between Lyle and someone named Norma Novelli, who was Lyle's one-time confidant, where Lyle described how he, quote, snowed the jury at his first trial with his testimony about abuse, end quote. Wow. Lyle's defense instead decided to tell the court that Lyle killed his parents in the heat of passion that fear and anger overwhelmed him on August 20th, 1989, when he and his brother Eric murdered their parents. Lyle was a reasonable man, but he reacted out of fear, anger, and passion that night. The prosecution came right back at the defense because they discovered also a letter Lyle had written his former girlfriend telling her instructing her how to testify at the first trial. On February 20th, 1996, the prosecution began closing arguments. They stated that the brother's defense was self-serving and filled with lies and inconsistencies. The jurors should reject claims of sexual abuse. On February 26th, 1996, the defense began their closing arguments. They accused the prosecution of presenting fraudulent witnesses in an effort to win the case for, quote, political reasons, end quote. What? They attacked the prosecution for using the taped confession of the brothers. Why would they not? The defense attorney ended by telling the jury how close she and Eric had grown and that it would, quote, be the ultimate tragedy in her life if he were convicted. How is that professional? <laughs> the defense also compared the Menendez case to a Greek tragedy, specifically suggesting that Jose and Kitty had brought their own demise because of fatal moral flaws. This is unbelievable. Well, March 1st, 1996, the jury began deliberation. March 20th, 1996, 19 days later, the jury convicted Lyle and Eric Menendez, each of two counts of first degree murder, as well as conspiracy to commit murder. The penalty phase now began on March 22nd, 1996. On April 4th, Dr. Vicari, who was a psychiatrist who treated Eric since 1990, admitted that he doctored his notes at the direction of attorney Leslie Abramson. Specifically, he omitted from his notes entire sections containing incriminating statements by Eric. He had also deleted 24, yes, 24 pages of statements Eric had made to him and rewrote 10 pages of notes. This didn't go over too well. On April 5th, Leslie Abramson invoked her Fifth Amendment privilege not to incriminate herself when she refused to answer two questions about her possible misconduct regarding Dr. Vicari's notes. On April 11th, the prosecution argued that the Menendez brothers should be sentenced to death. Because what they did was they chose to kill their parents in a quote, horrifying and brutal way, end quote. On April 12th, the jury began to deliberate in the penalty phase, whether the Menendez brothers should be sentenced to life in prison or sentenced to death. Well, April 17th, the jury had reached a decision. They voted for life in prison for both Lyle and Eric Menendez. On July 12, 1996, Judge Weisenberg sentenced Lyle and Eric Menendez to life in prison without the possibility of parole. The sentences 
would run consecutively for the murders in the charge of con conspiracy to commit murder. On September 10th, 1996, the California Department of Corrections separated the brothers, so they were sent to different prisons to serve their terms. So what ended up happening to them? Well, January 1997, Lyle married a longtime pen pal named Anna Erickson, who was a former model. The marriage ended less than a year because she discovered Lyle was cheating on her by writing to another woman. In November 2003, Lyle remarried to a woman named Rebecca Sneed, who was a magazine editor. Well, Eric, in 1997, reportedly married through a telephone ceremony in prison. Well, they later divorced. So in June 1999, Eric married again, this time to Tammy Ruth Sackerman in the prison waiting room. How romantic. Under the terms of their sentences, both Lyle and Eric Menendez are expected to spend the remainder of their lives in prison. And that ends episode three of Lyle and Eric, also known as the Menendez brothers. Thank you for sticking for another episode of Danny After Dark. Do you have any questions or any comments on the case? Leave them down below. Let's be interactive. Do you have a suggestion for a case you'd like me to cover? We'll leave it in a comment below and you may see your suggestion in a future episode. Until next time, remember, we don't live in darkness. Darkness lives in us.